Our second video on nationalism is going to get a little bit deeper into uh, European nationalism and how it begins to go and begin to sweep. Now, we've already talked about nationalism and seen how it has created nations in Central and South America as well as the Caribbean. And again, we're leaving out the United States' um, American Revolution. This is all happening at the same time here. So we're starting to see how this wave of nationalism is building here in Europe. Now, one way we can view nationalism is not so much in the sense of ethnic uh, disputes or I imperial uh, sh struggles for people yearning for freedom, but another way to view it as, as kind of a clash of philosophies, how political philosophies are also looking for people to hang on to the power that they have for new people who are rising through the creation of new social pyramids and, and new ledgers uh, in, in society and, and how they're asking for freedom as well as people who want to burn the whole thing down and let something new rise from the ashes. So that, that's how we can kind of see nationalism and, and political development being sprung out of and left in the wake of the French Revolution. So we've talked about some of these terms already before, but these are going to be terms that are really going to be helpful in our understanding of how people in Europe are asking or demanding or wanting change versus those who want to be able to keep on to the power that they have. So the first group are the conservatives. The conservatives were usually wealthy property owners and nobility. And this is, again, this should make sense. These are the people who have been in charge in Europe, who have had control of Europe to the end of the Roman Empire. Even some of these people are claiming descendancy from some of these larger families in the Roman Empire. And so they don't want any change. So for, for these different classes of uh, philosophies, we should understand who is in each group, what does each group want, and how much change does each group feel is necessary. The conservatives want no change. They argued for protecting the traditional monarchies of Europe. They want to rewind the clock to 1788 before the French Revolution took place. Some of them might even go before 1776, before we get the Declaration of Independence by the uh, future United States being issued. Th that's how little change they want. They want to hold on to the power that they already have. In a lot of these cases, this power has been slowly eroding, which we, we see this a lot in people's personalities and in history, where the more you're losing something, the more you're going to fight to be able to go and hang on to what you have. So the conservatives want no change. They're the ones in power. Why would they want any change? The liberals are going to be these middle class business leaders and merchants. Now we're getting into, we'll get in the tail, the, the second half of this unit with the Industrial Revolution. These philosophies are going hand in hand with the new economic and social realities being created with the uh, Industrial Revolution. And with the Industrial Revolution, a lot, a lot more people are starting to pull themselves out of abject poverty, are starting to live comfortable lifestyles, and are having, this is the key word and a key concept, free time to exercise political thoughts and political thinking and political actions. And this is where this new group is trying to fit itself in in the social kind of the structure and, and, and strata as well as the political atmosphere in Europe. So the liberals, middle class business leaders and, and merchants, the middle class here is the key part. And they want some change. Right? They want to give more power to elected parliaments. Now notice they're not calling for getting rid of kings. They're, this is again, they're looking for using England with its constitutional monarchy as a template where again the king is still there the king has some power so the liberals want to give more power to elected parliaments but and again that but is a key idea. they only want the educated and landowners to be able to vote they want people who are educated who've studied the problems of the day and or landowners people who have skin in the game to who, who, who own property, who are paying the major taxes to be able to vote. So there's limitation restrictions on who can vote, but they are opening up to more people voting and again, giving power to these people who are being elected. So the liberals, we can kind of say a medium amount of change, a middle amount of change, some change. The radicals are very different. So what the radicals want is a drastic change for democracy for all. And, and this is the key. Oh, that's a, hold on, let me go back. Let's pick a different color too. Whew. Go back to yellow. That's the key thing here. 
they're, they're, they're choosing the words carefully here. Democracy is, is the cult, is the hue, is the important thing. They're there is no true democracy. The United States isn't a true democracy. It's more democratic than what we have uh, in other types of governments. But the radicals want to burn everything to the ground. They want the ideas of the French Revolution to come to the forefront, liberté, equalité, fraternité, or in English, liberty, equality, brotherhood. And that's what they go and they want. They don't want any sort of stench or lingering odor of monarchy. They want it all gone. And so that's what they want. Conservatives, no change. Liberals, a little bit of change. Radicals, burn it all down. And out of the ashes rise a democracy. And for a lot of people, even today, to be honest, uh, there's some political groups who are saying, let's roll back who can vote and how we can vote and that stuff. Um, and so the, that idea of democracy for all. And some of these people mean all, right, I including women and, uh, and freeing slaves that, that that's how wild and crazy the radicals are for their time period so that's where we want to go and see that so these are the big three philosophies that are going to kind of be butting heads throughout the 1900s early 1800s into the 1900s even until today so the nationalists begin to challenge the conservative power and where and this is a key in europe the first country in europe to win its self-rule is going to be greece so Greek independence is going to be the model that other nationalists are going to kind of seize on and use as the impetus to start their national movements and kind of the template to build their nationalist uh, uprisings on. Now, Greece, at the start of the 1800s, the start of the 19th century, is part of the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire controls a territory of southeastern Europe called the Balkans. This contains the modern-day countries of Greece, Albania, Bulgaria, Romania, Turkey, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, Montenegro, and some others that kind of keep popping and bubbling up here. Since the time of Philip of Mastodon and his conquest of Greece, Greeks have been ruled by outside peoples since the, what do we say, 300s, 400s BC. So they are looking for someone, anyone, they to the Greeks to rise up and allow them to be ruled by Greeks for Greeks. So in 1821, inspired by the nationalist uh, uprisings in the United States, in South America, Central America, the Caribbean, as well as in some other places, the Greeks begin to rebel against the Ottomans in 1821. Now at first, powerful European governments opposed Greek independence. Again, these European governments run by kings, they are conservative, they do not want any change, they want to keep this virus of the French Revolution, and this virus of independence, and this virus of nationalism contained, so they don't want the Greeks to win independence, because if the Greeks become independence, then what about the Lithuanians, or the Poles, or the Latvians, or the, Pom the Pomeranians, or the Dalmatians, right? And so it, it becomes a major issue here. So even though the governments oppose Greek independence, it becomes very popular with people around the world, right? This goes back to why did we study ancient Greece in, in this year, right? The, the idea of Greece, of the Greek heritage, of Greek philosophy, of Greek poetry, of Greek art, of Greek ideals is still a, a fervent and, and holds sway over people's imagination, a classical European gentleman's Education would include being able to read Homer in the original ancient Greek. This popular pressure will go and eventually convince these governments to join the cause of Greek independence to support the Greek people with the understanding that, hey, we can support the Greek people, but just because we're supporting Greek independence doesn't mean we're supporting independence for any of these national groups that are within our own country. Eventually, with this European help, in the 1830s, Greece will sign a treaty with the Ottoman Empire, and that guarantees an independent Greek kingdom, the first independent Greek kingdom in Greece, ruled by Greeks for the Greek people since Philip of Mastodon's invasion in the uh, early couple of centuries BC. So good for the Greeks. So this is an area of southeastern Europe called the Balkans, and again by the early 1800s this is all controlled some places to some extent by the ottoman empire now since the ottomans had moved towards 
Budapest and in marched on Vienna in the 1600s, right? They've slowly been kind of worked their way and being pushed out of Europe, but they still have a very strong uh, grip on Greece, which in the 1820s, the Greeks try to rebel. And the Greeks are rebelling against the Ottoman Turks to where they finally win their independence in the 1830s. This is the spark that starts a chain reaction where the Ottomans begin to see more and more of these Balkan countries fight for and win their independence as the Ottoman Empire is pushed out of Greece into modern day Turkey. The next major thing that happens in the uh, European quest for nationalism are a bunch of revolutions in 1848. 1848 becomes one of these watershed years where these revolutionary ideas and these radical and liberal ideas percolate and bubble up to the forefront of politics, resulting in various and widespread ethnic uprisings erupting throughout all of Europe in this year. We see these uprisings in Vienna, Budapest, Paris, Prague, as all of these different groups are advocating for more rights, more uh, people who can vote, more uh, social change, more economic change, uh, again, coming out of this nationalist movement. These are all violently put down by 1849. There's a very much a conservative push against these revolutions, and there's a, a, a very much a big push towards uh, restoring the order. So again, we're seeing these kind of spasms of the French Revolution kind of erupt through here, and that's how much we can just kind of describe this aftershock of the French Revolution here in 1848. So conservatism is we're going to return, but really only in Paris are there demands for a democratic government. And so this demand for a more democratic government uh, is going to end King Louis Philippe's monarchy he goes and gives up the throne, and a new government is established. This government falls apart immediately. We've already seen France really starting to struggle with the concept of being ruled without a king. And what does that mean? This is going to result in vicious fighting in the Parisian streets as different uh, governments are, and peoples and political ideas are fighting in the street. They're tearing up the cobblestones and tearing down buildings to create fortresses to be able to go and attack as the French army has to go uh, and do that. Eventually, order is restored, elections are held, and France is going to elect Louis Napoleon, right, Napoleon's nephew, as their new leader. So he's a quasi-monarch. Uh, he's an elected official. Uh, it's, it's, he's not quite a president. He's not quite a king is the best way to go and put it for our uh, purposes. So this is a map uh, right out of our textbook. Uh, again, you can kind of see that these revolutions, are, it's not just, it's just in Paris or just in, say, Ireland. It's all throughout Europe as multiple groups Multiple ethnicities begin to rebel against different countries asking for stiff stuff there. Uh, in uh, Amsterdam, in Berlin, in Paris, uh, in Vienna, all these different groups uh, are advocating for their own slice of control and their own slice of the governmental pie. It's only in France that uh, Louis Napoleon becomes elected through, quote, democratic elections, end quote, to become the leader of what becomes the second republic of French history. So under Louis Napoleon, what did Louis Napoleon do to build nationalism in France? Well, due to universal voting, he gets a landslide election victory. Now remember, his uncle, Napoleon, had a landslide election victory and uh, maybe dubious voting stuff that's in there, but there's he does have a pretty popular mandate of which to launch his reforms on. Now, Louis Napoleon, in broad strokes, supported economic expansion and further industrial development. We're into the 1840s. The United States is starting to very much industrialize, starting to get into more heavy industry. Britain is leading the world in its textile production and its uh, coal mining and its um, railroad development. So the countries that... France might be looking up towards, say, Great Britain, say, an upstart United States, are very much industrializing, and Louis Napoleon is using government support to be able to go 
and drive that. The idea behind all this is that this is going to lead towards French prosperity, and this prosperity is going to be the answer to all of France's social problems. And again, France still dealing with the political, economic, religious, social impacts of not only the French Revolution, but Napoleon's uh, conquests and subsequent uh, defeat. So France is not really in the best place. So this is kind of going along with the saying that a rising tide lifts all boats. That this French prosperity that will come out of this is going to be the answer to a lot of the social problems that France is experiencing. So on Napoleon III's agenda, he, again, these economic successes are going to ease social and political tension. He's targeting public opinion here. But the major changes that he's doing is he's helping create new banks to be able to provide a better and more stable economic system for his country the building of railroads we'll talk about this with the, uh, the see this with the industrial revolution particularly when we get into our study of the united states industrial revolution junior year railroads are a very heavy industry think of all the iron and steel production that's involved to be able to help people out there He's going to use the government to issue public works projects. So this is not only giving people jobs to be able to go and build these things, but they are building things for the people to use, parts, uh, government buildings, uh, which is going to help people as well. Now, the key thing that he does, his most long-lasting impact, hints, winks, and nudges, we'll put a star next to this point because of how big of a deal this is, is that he is going to focus on rebuilding Paris. And with the Baron von Haussmann, his leading architect. Louis Napoleon is going to turn Paris from the medieval city that it is in the mid-1800s to, by the end of the 1870s, a modern megalopolis that is the envy of the world that is going to be copied by any other city that views itself as a major world city after that we'll show you some pictures that get into the idea but again his biggest longest impact hints winks and nudges is his rebuilding of paris he's going to allow for unions and strikes uh which is going to help uh people as well and again when we get into the industrial revolution we'll see how unions and strikes are going to do wonderful things for the workers in the industrial revolution the rebuilding of paris is very much an offshoot of the issues that happened during the 1848 uprisings in Paris, where people were pulling down these medieval buildings. These are tight, narrow streets uh, in some places that only a width of a man's shoulders wide. Uh, they've got cobblestones and the, the it's tight, narrow alleyways, not a whole lot of sunlight getting here because again, there's a whole lot of people showing up in Paris in the beginning of the 1800s for a variety of different reasons, but we're starting to squeeze. This is an ancient medieval city that is starting to feel the squeeze of this 19th century population increase. The city's bursting at its seams. So to offset any future uprisings, right, and to also be able to kind of clear out some of the slums and some of the other stuff, he and the Baron von Hausmann literally run bulldozers through streets like the one on the left and the one on the right. And so I know this is a painting, and they're going to bulldoze their way through Paris, create these big, huge, giant, wide, tree-lined avenues with very similar facades in the building on there. And this is kind of your classical view of Paris. I think this is the Rue des Champs Germain, uh, which very wide boulevards, so it's hard for people to pull down the buildings and the French commune to go and form stuff up, right, uh, to be able to go and plant trees on there to bring some greenery to these cities and kind of become the face of modern Paris. If you go and see an aerial view of Paris, again, you can literally see driving these avenues, big wide avenues through the city. Uh, a little bit more recent picture is, again, you can see there's the Arc de Triomphe, there's the Champs-Élysées, and we see these big, huge, giant tree-lined avenues bulldozed through Paris to kind of give it that wide, modern, walkable city feel. Uh, Paris becomes nicknamed the City of Lights because as they're bulldozing these uh, boulevards and avenues through the city, they're putting up street lamps and street lights, and they're going to electrify very uh, often to be able to go and uh, bring light to this medieval city. Uh, New York is going to copy what Paris is going to do. Chicago, when it burns down in the Great Chicago Fire, when it rises from the ashes, is going to build these big, great, giant 
avenues. Michigan Avenue is a direct copy of what they're doing here from Paris. And this, can, again, becomes the model for what other world cities are going to try to emulate and create on their own scale in their own country. So we're going to be moving from Paris to Russia. Now, reform in Russia is going to stem from the 1853 Crimean War. If you're paying any attention to world politics in 2023, when this is being recorded, you understand that it's still being a issue between Russia and other people, the Crimean Peninsula today. Basically, the Crimean War is where Russia wants to take the Crimean Peninsula away from the Ottomans. So here, let's draw you a map. So uh, here is Europe, there's Italy, do, 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 do. there's the Adriatic, there's Greece, then you got the Ottoman Empire down over here, right? So that's Africa, All right? Um, and then we go up through the Dardanelles, then you've got the Black Sea here. The Crimean Peninsula is a spit of land that juts out into here. Now, Russia wants this because this is going to give access to the uh, come on, Mediterranean Sea. You get the idea. La, 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 right? So it, this gives Russia a southern port. Why does it need a southern port? Because Russia can't go up north for most of the year because it's cold in Russia. So that's why... They want this Crimean Peninsula. And again, they're making the argument it's been Russian for our centuries, blah, 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 blah. So Russia wants this. Now, importantly, France, Great Britain, Sardinia, and the Ottomans do not want Russia to have this. Because if Russia has the Crimean Peninsula, they can make more money. They can be more industrialized. They're going to get a uh, rise up in power. And remember, the whole part of the... Metternich system, the whole point of the Congress of Vienna was to balance the power in Europe. A Russia with a southern uh, port that can be ship stuff out year-round is going to make for a more pop powerful Russia, upset the balance of power. That ain't no good. So the Crimean War is going to end up being a loss for Russia. They're going to lose the combined forces in 1856 to France, Britain, Sardinia, and the Ottomans. This is going to cause Tsar Alexander II to very much take a step back and try to look at what Russia's future is going to be from a more 35,000-foot view. Where has Russia been? Where is Russia going? Why is Russia having all these problems fighting off these tiny little nations compared to itself? So the Tsar says we need to modernize, we need to reform, we need to pull ourselves out of the 1200s and move into the modern world of the 19th century. So he begins to go and pull off some reforms. He frees the serfs in 1861. So if you're keeping track here, the United States still has slaves in 1861, but Russia, Russia is freeing its serfs. Now those serfs are still in debt to the government. It's, it's not a free clear, but they're free. And he begins to push further reforms before Conservatives within the government don't like this and work to assassinate Tsar Alexander II in 1881. His son, who becomes Tsar Alexander III, is going to encourage further industrial development in Russia, but this is going to be much more measured because Tsar Alexander III, one, is upset that his father was assassinated and wants to root out those forces, but realizes the more he pushes industrialization, the more freedoms he's going to have to give his people, and he doesn't want that. He wants to want to have that auto, the autocratic rule, the absolute rule that the czars of Russia have had for generations by this point. So here, here's Constantinople down here on the left. So here's the Crimean Peninsula. This is most of the modern-day Ukraine up here. And so that's what this is mostly fighting over, to keep the Russians out of Crimea. So some big famous battles that take place during the Crimean War include Sevastopol, Inkerman, Balaclava, uh, which are big important things. And then again, we get uh, big important paintings and all this stuff becomes in British lore here, including the famous Charge of the Light Brigade, where 600 cavalry soldiers for the British army charged into a valley ringed on three sides by Russian artillery and they are kind of mowed down to the man uh, and out of this uh, this very impressive uh, very romantic military is awesome this is so much fun charge um, that, that kind of is put up it is a poem by Alfred Lloyd Tennyson 
uh, who writes about the charge of life brigade half a league half a league half a league onward all into the valley of death road the 600 forward the life brigade charge into the guns he said into the valley of death road the 600 uh, forward the life brigade was there a man dismayed not though the soldier knew someone had blundered theirs was not to make a reply there was not to reason why theirs was but to do and die into the valley of death road to the 600 when can their glory fade oh the wild charge they made so what we're trying to get out of here what tennyson is very much doing is saying look how great warfare is awesome 600 guys put their lives on the line for britain for this nationalism for this whole idea yeah a lot of them die but how oh, how awesome war is stuff is there so this is very much the height of of this romanticizing warfare, of making warfare uh, into this great game that these noblemen and people can aspire to. And it's this kind of things that are gonna happen in the 1800s, which is going to make the shocking, horrible, horrific, modern industrialized death on the Western Front in World War I, 67 years later, such a shock to people who are growing up in the, the the soldiers that are going to be teenagers and 20 year olds fighting on the Somme and at Ypres and in the Western Front are, are reading poems like Tennyson and they're getting this kind of and that's what we'll kind of see this disconnect and we'll get more that's more we'll talk about in World War One we get ahead of myself so Tsar Alexander the second is going to realize from this loss that he needs to modernize, pull Russia into the modern world. He's going to go free the serfs, but this change is going to come at the cost of people's power, of people's money, and at the loss of his life. He's grenades rolled underneath his carriage, and he's blown out of the carriage, and he's killed and speed uh, on the ground there, uh, whatever the, what this drawing shows. His son, Tsar Alexander III, is going to further in industrial development, but again, it's going to be much more measured growth because he does not want Russia to, again, get too much power away from himself. Now, Russia, as it continues reforms, remember the Russian Empire is all these different ethnicities underneath it. The Russian Tsars rule over Russians, Ukrainians, Poles, Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, Finns, Jews, Romanians, Georgians, Armenians, Turks, and various other ethnic groups, each with its own culture, each with its own language, each with its own laws, each with its own history. And so how do you get all these different ethnic groups under one rule? The Russians have been doing this for generations by the sword. But the Romanov dynasty under Alexander III and his sons and grandsons to follow are determined to maintain control. And so with all of these nationalist uprisings, the Russian Empire does not want all those different groups inside of Russia to get their own nation state. So they institute a policy of unification. So Russification, the forcing of Russian culture on all ethnic groups of the empire, is a policy of unification. The key word here, though, is the forcing of russian culture they're not asking politely they're forcing people to go and do this and ukrainians don't want to learn russian lithuanians don't want to learn about russian culture they want to learn about their own culture they want their own spot of land on the earth so these groups begin to push back on this which causes further forcing of russification which causes further pushback this becomes an endless cycle of violence so this is actually a key point down here we'll put a star next to this is that this is a policy for unification that actually works to disunify russia and increase nationalist feelings amongst these different ethnic groups in the empire each one of these different groups now wants to be able to have their own nation because they don't want to have this policy being forced on them. So while this idea came out to be able to unify Russia and bring Russia closer together, the Russification in the long term actually worked to further disunify Russia and cause its eventual disintegration. So if we take a look at Russia from a ethnic standpoint you can see all these different ethnic groups and ethnic peoples in there and the russians are going to have a problem which continues even into this day in the early 2000s chechnya tried to break away from the modern russian state there was a giant war that the russian nation had to fight with the chechens in there how do you rule all these different ethnicities uh 
Alexander III says, well, let's try to get everybody to learn Russian. And this forcing, and again, that key word of forcing, is going to end up disunifying and breaking apart the giant Russian empire that we will, uh, that, that's come into existence. So we'll pause here in our story of nationalism, and we'll pick it up with two other countries that we'll focus on in our next video, Italy and Germany especially, as well as some of the art movements that are born out of this uh, 1800 political, economic, and national change.